continuing on through 2 Samuel, and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 3. So far, friends, as we've been going through this book here, we've seen how David, he is king at this point. He's king of Judah. He's not king over all of Israel yet. But David is serving as an example to us. Last week, we saw how he was an example of someone who was waiting on the Lord. This week, we start to see how David kind of starts to go off the rails a little bit, and he strays a bit. We see some chinks in his armor here for the very first time. And the title of my sermon is not on the screen for you this morning because we don't have PowerPoint, but, but the, the title is God's Original Design. And David here this morning, we see how he started to stray a little bit from God's original design. We're going to read, uh, it's chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 on through to verses 16. But I'm going to break it up a little bit, and we're just going to read the first five verses, and then in a little bit we'll read verses 6 through to 16. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon, the son of Ahinoam of Jezreel. His second, Kiliab, the son of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. The third, Absalom, the son of Maka, daughter of Talmai, king of Jeshur. The fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital. And the sixth, Ithrium, the son of David's wife, Egla. These were born to David in Hebron. If you look at verse 1 there, it says that the house of David grew stronger and stronger. And I asked myself the question when I read that, how is it that the house of David is growing stronger and stronger? What is he doing to make it grow stronger and stronger? And the text doesn't come right out and say, this is exactly how he's doing it. This is exactly how he's becoming stronger and stronger. But if you look at the verses that follow, we do get a pretty good idea of how David's is growing stronger and stronger. His kingdom is growing. David, he is shoring up, this is what he's doing. He is mainly shoring up political alliances through marriage. This was in a day and age when a culture, uh, in a culture, in a day and age when a man had many wives, and a lot of the time, especially if you were in royalty, you would marry royal families from other nations, and you would form an alliance with them through marriage. That is largely what is going on here with David. Specifically, I'll give you one example here. This is his marriage to Maka, spoken of in verse 3. The marriage of David to Maka, the daughter of a foreign king, this is what one commentator writes, had a political dimension. Geshur was a small kingdom on the east side of the Jordan River to the north. In other words, it was on the other side of Ishbosheth's base in Mahanaim. During his time in Hebron, David formed a relationship by this marriage with a kingdom that was strategically located to bring pressure on the house of Saul. This marriage was no doubt part of David's growing stronger and stronger. He is marrying for the sake of making his kingdom stronger and stronger. Now that is not the case with every single marriage that David had. If you read later on in 2 Samuel, he got married to Bathsheba. There's no, the, the, he didn't marry her out of a political alliance or anything like that. If you keep going through our text here this morning, if you go uh, past verse 5 there and on to verse 6 and 16, it talks about another one of David's wives, and that is Michal. She was David's first wife, and she was given to him in marriage about 12 years prior on the narrative, on the storyline to where we are right now. She was the daughter of Saul. And Saul, of course, did not like David, but he gave David his young, he, he, he gave David his daughter, Michal. And if you recall the arrangement, David was to go out and get 100 Philistine foreskins, and that was going to be the price. And David, he actually went out and got 200 of them and brought them back. And that was the price for marrying Saul's daughter. We read about it in 1 Samuel 18. David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented the full number to the king so that he might become the king's son-in-law. 
Then Saul gave him his daughter Michal in marriage. So right now in our narrative, actually, if you're familiar with this story, David and Michal are not together. David's been on the run for 12 year, 10, 10 to 12 years here, and he hasn't been with her at all. But they are about to be reunited here, and the text tells us how this happens. So this is verses 6 on through to 16, and that is where we'll stop. During the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Now Saul had had a concubine named Rizpah, daughter of Ai, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Abner was very angry because of what Ishbosheth said and answered, Am I a dog's head on Judah's side? This very day I am loyal to the house of your father Saul and to his family and friends. I haven't handed you over to David. Yet now you accuse me of an offense involving this woman. May God deal with Abner, be it ever so severely, if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him on oath, and transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and establish David's throne over Israel and Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Ishbosheth did not dare to say another word to Abner because he was afraid of him. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to say to David, Whose land is it? Make an agreement with me, and I will help you bring all Israel over to you. Good, said David. I will make an agreement with you. But I demand one thing of you. Do not come into my presence unless you bring Michal, daughter of Saul, when you come to see me. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, son of Saul, demanding, Give me my wife Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for the price of a hundred Philistine foreskins. So Ithbosheth gave orders and had her taken away from her husband, Paltiel, son of Laish. Her husband, however, went with her, weeping behind her all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, go back home. So he went back. Again, friends, this is probably another instance of David shoring up political alliances via marriage. Uh, it's not necessarily the fact that he loved her deeply and he missed her for 12 years. It could be part of it too. But there's also a strategic aspect of this on David's part. One commentator said, Through his years in Hebron, David had learned the political value of marriages. The return of Michal would represent an acknowledgement on the part of the house of Saul of David's rights. It would imply that Saul had been wrong not only in taking Michal from David, but in all his opposition to David. The return of Michal, in other words, would represent a change in the house of Saul's attitude toward David. It would, we might say, be an expression of repentance. Michal's return would be a token of the nation being transferred to David. And so, my friends, there's a bit of an understanding here now of how it is that David is growing stronger and stronger. Some of the marriages, again, might have been based on romance or whatever, but there's definitely a political alliance, alliance is being made. Whatever the reason, I just want to look at one main thing here, friends, and that is, this is where David goes wrong. This is where he goes wrong. He had many wives, and he should not have had many wives. This is one of the big mistakes David made throughout his life. Two thoughts for you here. We're going to first focus on David's mistake, and then we're going to move on and apply it more to ourselves. David's mistake. At this point in the narrative, if you add it up, he has seven wives. Now, he, do he, he doesn't stop there. Later on, he's just king of Judah right now, but later on he becomes king of Israel, and he acquires even more wives. First Chronicles 14 in verse 3, this is after he has become king of all of Israel. The text says, in Jerusalem, David took more wives and became the father of more sons and daughters. Now, there is, of course, nothing wrong with having more sons and more daughters. There's nothing wrong with having many children. As the psalmist said, sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is 
full of them. That wasn't the problem, having many kids. The problem is in having many wives. That is where he strayed. And it's interesting here because David, he was a man who meditated on the law of the Lord. He knew the law of the Lord. He had the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He had them. He knew them. But this is what Deuteronomy says actually here. It, it, it could not be clearer. These are instructions being given here to the nation of Israel about when you have a future king, this is the way he's supposed to be. And this is what the text says. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and take possession of it and settle in it, and settle in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the other nations around us. They did that. That was how they got Saul. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. And here it is, friends, right here. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. Not supposed to have many wives. He must not accumulate also large amounts of silver and gold. Not supposed to have many wives. Now, we don't necessarily see the truth of this played out in the life of David because the text says, or his heart will be led astray. When we read that, we think of Solomon. And if you think David had quite a few wives, you haven't seen anything yet. Solomon in 1 Kings 11 verse 3, we read, he had how many? Anyone know? 300? He had a pile of them. He had a pile. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And then the verse concludes, and his wives led him astray. Just as was foretold in the scriptures years earlier, if you go down this road and have many wives, this is what is going to happen. And of course it did happen. Solomon, he started well, he didn't finish well, and it was his wives that led him astray. In regards to David, again, he's got multiple wives. If you kind of step back and you just take a snapshot of his life, you kind of just look, give it a bit of an overview, maybe look at it from 30,000 feet, you kind of see that many of the problems David experienced in his life was a, was a result of the fact that he went wrong on this one key issue here. He had many wives. Years later, down the road, um, he would flee from Jerusalem. He was king of Jerusalem of Israel, but he fled from there. The reason he fled from there was because his one son, Absalom, who's actually mentioned in the first five verses we read here this morning, he was trying to steal the throne from his father. And once again, it was a bit of a deja vu moment in David's life. He's now running around, fleeing for his life, just like he was years earlier from Saul. How did it happen? How did it happen? If you know the story, David, and since 2 Samuel chapter 11 will be there in a few months, David had coveted another man's wife. Again, went right, a, right against the law of the Lord. You shall not covet another man's wife. Um, Slept with her, had a kid with her, married her, murdered her husband. And because of that, so what he did was, David, in that moment, he added another wife to his already growing number. Nathan came and uh, confronted him over this, if you recall. And this is what Nathan said to him. This is what the Lord says, Out of your own household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Why did it all happen? Uh, David had an affair with Bathsheba. He made her wife number who knows what at that point. Goes back to, again, this issue in David's life. One author said, David's, this is J. Oswald Sanders, David's greatest fault lay in his yielding to passions of the flesh. 
His greatest fault lay in his yielding to passions of the flesh. David had a thing for women. Now, when you think of biblical characters who kind of had a thing for women, you think of maybe uh, Samson. He was definitely one. Maybe we could throw Solomon in there too. You could probably throw some others in there as well. But David, he fit into that category too. And it did not serve him well. The multiple wives thing. Here, friends, remember the title of the sermon is God's original design. Here is God's original design. Here is what this was supposed to look like. Here's what the family was supposed to look like. We read about it in the beginning, Genesis chapter 2. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You'll notice the text says he shall be united to his wife. It doesn't say he shall be united to his wives. He shall be united to his wife. The Lord put one man and one woman in the Garden of Eden. He did not put one man and 20 women in the Garden of Eden. That was not the original design. That was not the way it was supposed to work. And what he was doing here in the Garden of Eden is he is establishing a pattern for us to follow. You see this as well other places in the early chapters of Genesis. The Lord worked for six days and he rested for one. Why did he do that? The Lord doesn't need to rest. He doesn't grow tired or weary as we do. Why did he work six days and rest for one? The answer is he's establishing a pattern for us to follow. Same thing here going on in regards to one man and one woman being together. He was establishing a pattern for us to follow. Walt Kaiser, the Old Testament theologian, he actually wrote a book on tough questions to be asked about the Old Testament. And in there, he, actually, uh, he, he wrote one chapter right on the subject of polygamy, very interesting chapter, and what the Old Testament, how it deals with that subject. He said this, Genesis 2, 21 to 24, the passage we just read, presents the first man and woman in a monogamous marriage, which from that time on, was described in scripture as the normative pattern for marriage or the will of God in such relationships. And of course you see scripture affirming this elsewhere later on. You see it in the New Testament. Jesus, he affirmed this as well. In Mark 10, he said, I think he was talking with the Pharisees at this point. He was talking about divorce. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wives. No, be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul, he said, But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife. Singular. And each woman her own husband. Singular. And I was thinking about this and I said to myself, you add to that the fact that Jesus Christ, he has one bride. He doesn't have many brides. He has one bride, the church. Again, there's a picture for us there. God's design from the beginning was not what David was doing. God's design was one man, one woman... And it should, not, it should not come as a surprise, friends, that when you start straying from God's original design, things don't work out so well. When you stray from his original design the way he intended it to be, it does not work out so well. You see that particularly in the passage my dad read about Rachel and Leah. You want to talk about a dysfunctional family. Why? Jacob had two wives, and it didn't help the fact that they were sisters either. 
and they're in competition with each other. It's just a completely messed up family dynamic that caused problems, not just in that generation, but in the generation to come. Because now there are favorite wives, and it makes sense that you are now going to have favorite children too, because the women born of the favorite wife, that the children born of the, fam of the favorite wife are going to be the favorite children. And then you have Joseph and his brothers fighting and not get along, and one of them gets sold on through e off to Egypt. It just it <coughs> problem after problem after problem. Walt Kaiser said this of Rachel and Leah: the resulting jealousy and competition that arose between Leah and Rachel, now Jacob's two wives, is a testimony that can be repeated from those who have lived in polygamous homes. The divine wisdom in having only one wife is seen in God's making Eve the sole wife for Adam. For no man is capable of loving two wives equally at the same time. He will always favor one over the other. It didn't work out so well for David either, though I would argue the not working out so well, it's more clearly seen in Jacob's household, also in Solomon's household. It doesn't go over well. They led him astray. And again, friends, this should not come as a surprise to us. When you start straying from God's design, it's not going to go well. I had in my mind, actually, the picture of, when I was putting this together, just a car. Take a Honda Civic, okay? A Honda Civic is not made for jumping ditches. And if you take the Honda Civic, it, wasn't, it was not originally designed for that. And if you take your Honda Civic car and start jumping ditches with it, it's not going to go over well. The only time jumping ditches with a car ever went well was on the Dukes of Hazard, And the General Lee could jump ditches and jump trains and never got damaged at all. But if you watch how they made, the, how they made that TV show, they had dozens and dozens of General Lees. So that when the axle snapped on one after it jumped the train, they'd just throw it to the side, grab another one, and keep going. It doesn't actually work. You use a dirt bike to jump ditches. It, it, a dirt bike is designed for that. It can take it. it was, that's what it was made for. When you, but a car is not. You might get away with it once, if you're lucky, maybe twice. But you're going to run into problems. You're step, because you're stepping outside of what it was designed, of how it was designed. It wasn't, you're stepping outside of the manufacturer's recommendations, you could say. This is what David did, and it caused problems in his life. Now, we jump from David, friends. We jump to our culture here. We jump from David to our culture. There's a warning here from the life of David. A very firm warning. It's a reminder to us. The very first institution that God established at creation was the one we already considered. Marriage. One man, one woman. David, he distorted that. And we're still messing with it today, actually. We're still messing with it today. Now, to the best of my knowledge, polygamy is not a huge issue in our society, although it still does exist in certain cultures and certain places. I remember back when I was truck driving, I was driving through, I think it was Nevada, and NPR was doing a special on, they were talking about what uh, three-parent homes and how, and how you, know, you should function as a three-parent home. And that was five, six years ago. It has not gotten better since. Romans 1, 26 to 27. Because these two, these two verses apply here. In our culture today, again, it's not so much polygamy, where they're messing with the original design of the family and what God intended. It is more so the idea that in the Garden of Eden, it would have been perfectly fine for there to be a man and a man in the Garden of Eden. Or for there to have been a woman and a woman in the Garden of Eden. Paul, he talks about that practice here. He said, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. It's the practice of homosexuality. A man and a man, 
or a woman and a woman. Again, this is a stray. This is a deviation from God's original design. One author, he said, when man forsakes the author of nature, he inevitably forsakes the order of nature. And this is what is going on in our culture here today. I read a book in Bible college. It didn't make much sense to me at the time, but I was, I, I was reading through it. And there's one part in there. I read and I underlined and putting this sermon together, I thought of it. This is, he wrote this, this was probably about 10 years ago. In our culture today, you don't hear about homosexuality quite so much as you hear about certain other deviations, certain other distortions of God's original design for the family. But he wrote this uh, at the time when homosexuality was, and it still is to some extent, very largely a big thing, though maybe not talked about quite so much. He said, homosexuality has gained significant cultural acceptance, and that acceptance is now right in the mainstream. That there is this widespread support for homosexuality is itself significant. But of far greater significance is the fact that it is only one part of a profound, multi-pronged effort to redefine the family. We are in the midst of a massive social experiment. We are redefining the most basic building block of any society. The Marxists tried to redesign the class system of their day. That attempt now lies in ruins. Today, many Western societies are attempting, in an experiment equally bold, to rewrite their society's ground rules about families. One suspects, though, that the outcome will not be very different. When these social experiments collapse, they bring behind them immense confusion, disorder, and suffering. And again, homosexuality, that particular deviation from the way God designed it, that's only one way our, cul our, our culture's messing with God's original design. I didn't realize this was a thing until about a year ago when New York's mayor, Bill de Blasio, made the news because he had announced that he was going to have an open marriage. And I said, what in the world is that? So I looked it up. Here's another deviation for you. An open marriage. A marriage or relationship in which both partners agree that each may have sexual relations with others. In which case you don't even have a marriage relationship at this point. But this is just the way our culture is distorting God's original design. And how does it all end? We're still on this great social experiment here, our society is. But it is not going to end well. It didn't end well for Jacob. It didn't end well for Solomon. It didn't work out well with David. When you stray from the design, from what the designer recommended, it is not going to end well. Simple reason, because it goes against God's design. And I thought we would bring this to a conclusion, friends, just by considering how we might apply this to ourselves. Um, because we can, we can hear all this and we could say, well, I'm... I'm not deviating from God's original design. I mean, you could say, well, I don't have an open marriage. To which I say that is good. I'm very glad for that because that would be a difficult conversation we'd be having later if you did. But there are other ways, friends, even that we as Christians can sometimes deviate from God's design. I just give you a few here and I, I, I want to talk about one a little bit more specifically here in closing. But, uh, for example, we were designed to be productive individuals. When, we were, uh, when God created man, he said to be fruitful and multiply, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. He put man, uh, he put them in the garden and he, to tend the garden. You're supposed to be a productive individual. That's the design for us. We're also designed to rest. You are to work six days and rest for one, God made the Sabbath for man. You are to take a break. If you don't, if you work uh, 24 hours, seven days a week for a year, you're going to burn yourself out. You weren't designed for that. And I leave you with this one. We were designed also to be dependent upon God. We were designed to be dependent upon God. And if you're living your life in such a way that you are not 
dependent upon him, you're not in line with God's design. I was reading through uh, Neil Anderson's book, Bondage Breaker, some years ago, and there's just one line in there I underlined because it caught my attention. He said, we were not designed, there's that word again, designed, we were not designed to function independent of God. David, again, we could go back and conclude with him here. He has strayed from God's design in regards to the family. But this is a way, actually, friends, and we could end on a higher note here. David is an example to us of how he, he lived within God's design. He was dependent upon the Lord. We saw that, I think it was two weeks ago. Saul is dead now. And what does the text say in the course of time? 2 Samuel 2 and verse 1. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord. He's asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? I mean, he is, he is dependent upon him for his leading, for his guiding. You start going through the Psalms. I want to direct your attention to Psalm 23. He also said in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. I think the King James says, The Lord is, he is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord was everything to the psalmist, to David. The psalmist did not live independently of God whatsoever. You weren't designed to live independently of him. If you want to try it again, it won't work well. I was reading Psalm 23, and I was reading it, and I, it was thinking about it in a bit of a different light than what I previously have. If you just look at how often, it's, I'll just read it for you. It is the picture of a shepherd and his sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You just look at the first four verses and you get the impression here that without the shepherd, the sheep would be in absolute trouble. Absolute trouble. It's, it's the picture. David's painting a picture here. The shepherd, that is the Lord. He is, of course, the good shepherd, as John referred to him as. And he is also, uh, David is the sheep. And David knew, because he was a shepherd in his younger years. He knew from personal experience the sheep aren't going to last too long if they want to function independent of the shepherd. You have to function. The, the, the sheep are reliant upon the shepherd for pretty much everything. 1 Samuel 17. David is talking to Saul. You remember this conversation. And David says to him, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Without David watching over the sheep, where would the sheep have been? They would have been dinner. They would have been lunch. Philip Keller, he wrote a book. He was a shepherd, actually, and he wrote a book just on Psalm 23. He said, sheep do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose. They require more than any other class of livestock, endless attention and meticulous care. From the sheep's standpoint, it is knowing that the shepherd is there. It is the constant awareness of his presence nearby that automatically eliminates most of the difficulties and dangers while at the same time providing a sense of security and serenity. It is the sheep owner's presence that guarantees there will be no lack of any sort. There will be abundant green pastures. There, there will be still clean waters. There will be new paths into fresh fields. There will be safe summers on the high tablelands. There'll be freedom from, here, from fear. There will be antidotes for flies and diseases and parasites. There'll be quietness and contentment. All the benefits, friends. Uh, you, you get the picture here. The sheep were not designed to live independent of the shepherd. You were not designed to live independent of God either. If you're trying it, it'll, it'll, 
you might get away with it for a day or two, it will end in failure for you. So friends, that's just one way. That's just one way because we can look at David and we can get down on him for messing with God's design and deviating from it. We have to take stock of our own lives and ask ourselves, are we deviating from his design in any way? It's not just in regards to the family. Again, you can live independent of the Lord. You can, uh, you can not follow his uh, plan for work and for rest. There's many different ways of doing it. But I just leave you with that one. Take stock. We need to take stock of our own lives and consider, are we deviating from his plan in any way? Last week, the message was about not straying from God's timing. This week, friends... Remember, do not stray from his design. Do not stray from his design. Elsie, 638. There's a good one, friends. If the, uh, there is a good song to sing uh, if you want your heart to be a posture of relying upon the Lord and being dependent upon the Lord. This, this is what we were designed to do. This was the way we were designed to be right here. This is supposed to be our heart's attitude. 638, I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour.